Welcome to Twitch Streaming 101. Uh, we're here to give you all of the information that you need to make a success of yourself on Twitch, whether that's at the affiliate level or pushing yourself all the way up to partnership level. Uh, myself, I'm sure you're wondering who this scruffy dude is trying to teach you all about Twitch. Uh, so I'm known as School Muzzer on Twitch, uh, but I also run a partner channel under the name of Senshudo. Uh, we actually work as a company as well to provide extra tools around streaming as well, so a bunch of extra analytics that Twitch don't deliver. Uh, I've been on the platform since, well, the platform started, basically, when uh, Justin TV forward slash gaming spun off and became Twitch. Uh, so it's been over seven years at this point that I've been around on Twitch. I've helped multiple people through their affiliate process and also multiple people through onto their partnership process. Um, so I'd like to think that I've got quite a lot of information to impart to you across the course of this uh, set of lectures. Uh, but it's not just myself on this course as well. Uh, you've also got the wonderfully talented Renessa, who I'll let introduce herself. I'm Renessa. I've been streaming on Twitch since, hmm, I think the fall of 2014. I mostly stream a game called Dota 2. I started out streaming my uh, practice matches with my team, as well as casting professional games. And eventually I transitioned into just gameplay streaming, uh, occasional variety, but I'm, I'm pretty, pretty hardcore into Dota 2. And just focused on building my community, hanging out with all the awesome people that support me, and really just integrating myself into the streaming and esports scene as much as possible. So in addition to Twitch streaming, I do a lot of cosplay, and I also do hosting and interviewing for different esports events. And I'm really excited to share with you guys everything that I've learned about graphics, interacting with your community, setting up your stream, all these different really, really cool things that I'm very passionate about and have had a ton of fun with over the past several years. So hopefully you can appreciate that uh, we will hopefully have a bit of information to provide you guys and to actually help you get further across on your journey on Twitch. Uh, so the bits and pieces we'll be covering across on this course, uh, we're going to be going across how to set your stream in the first place, so with XSplit or OBS, and just getting those basic settings put into place. Uh, how to actually build a gaming rig, so whether it's just for gaming, or if it's going to be a, a streaming rig as well, uh, or if it's going to be a combination rig, um, and the different bits and pieces and the different bits of hardware that you can get put into there as well. Uh, how to design your aesthetic on Twitch as well, so you, the look, the feel, the different bits and pieces that really make you look like you on Twitch. Uh, how to really sort of push your stream to the next level, so using stuff like bots and alerts and uh, extensions as well to really kind of build more of a feel around your stream and to provide some fantastic information for your viewers. Uh, some of the streaming best practices that you can have as well, so things that you really should or shouldn't be doing in order to make sure that your stream's sort of the most acceptable and the most positive uh, experience for your viewers. Uh, how to market your stream as well, so across some media platforms, uh, your Twitter, your Facebook, your YouTube, your Instagram, that kind of stuff. How to really kind of get the word out there without kind of seeming like a scumbag at the same time, which is an easy mistake to make. Um, some of the streaming culture as well, so uh, streaming is a little bit of a weird thing, especially Twitch in particular. Uh, lots of memes and different bits and pieces like that that are easily kind of confusable, uh, so we'll be covering over some of that. Uh, how to really build up your community as well, so how to sort of put stuff in place that really makes your community feel valued and to make sure that they really feel like they're um, having a real difference on your day. And then we're going to wrap all of that up for you at the end to make sure that everything that you've learned across this entire course is going to really impact for what you're trying to do with your channel and to make sure that everything's really sunk in and you're taking away the points that you really need to with that. Now, with this course, uh, we do really welcome you to leave us a rating at the end as well. Uh, that's something that's really important to us because it really helps us learn what we need to do better next time if we haven't done that already for you um, and, and where we have gone wrong or where we've gone really right so far so we can ensure that we're doing the same things in future. Um, so if you can make sure that you leave some, some kind of comment for us there, it's hugely, hugely appreciated. Uh, but without further ado, let's get plowing on. Let's really start making some progress on this course and let's get you to the next level on your Twitch journey.
Now, considering we're sat here talking on a course about Twitch, I would probably expect you would have an idea about what Twitch is already, but from a high level, let's just cover over what Twitch is, how it roughly works, and some of the idea of what you can expect around the platform as a whole. So, first and foremost, streaming is a way to share your content with potentially millions of people around the world. Whatever it is that you're doing, whether it's gaming, creative, maybe you're painting something, maybe you're sewing something, maybe you're making music, maybe you're programming a game and then playing that game later on. There's a hell of a lot of different things that you could be doing on the platform, but it's your way of sharing it along with your chat and your community and having that interactivity back and forth to really create some compelling content. Now, the reason that we're really focusing in on Twitch on this occasion is because while there are other platforms out there like Mixer, Smashcast, YouTube Gaming, and, and plenty of others besides as well, uh, Twitch is by far the most developed. It's certainly the largest as well and the most sort of actively worked upon. So we're going to concentrate on Twitch because it's the area where honestly you have the highest chance of success at this point in time. That may change in the future, but I don't see it changing for quite a long time. Now, to give you a few ideas of how Twitch can be the successful platform for you, you've got people like Man vs. Game, for example. Now, he's travelled the world hosting events for Twitch. He's earned six figures in a year very easily uh, just through working on Twitch. And it's, it's become his life. He's been one of the old school guys from more or less the, the very inception of Twitch and always been kind of almost a poster boy. But it really shows that it can be a really lucrative opportunity for you if you sort of strike by the iron's heart and you've uh, got the ability to really work with the platform well. Uh, Zombie Unicorn is another fantastic example as well. Uh, again, she's done a lot of event hosting. Uh, she streams full-time as her job. She's actually done a course with us previously at Level Up Dojo, uh, which you can take a look at for yourself and you know judge the, the level of her success through that as well, as she has some fantastic advice to provide. Uh, so there's some really great success stories on Twitch. I mean, that's just a couple of instances, but there's a hell of a lot of different people who are making full-time jobs out of streaming, they're paying for a lot of stuff through streaming, through the high sub counts that they get. Uh, someone else that did a course for us, Ninja, uh, just recently at the point of recording this, uh, I believe he's over about 160,000 Twitch subs, and that's not people following him, that's people paying him a minimum of 4 99 per month. So that's pretty wild. <laughs> now, you can see success on Twitch, and I know I've kind of hyped it up there, but don't quit your day job just yet. Don't plunge head on into Twitch because it can be pretty hard to succeed on Twitch. And certainly after having a level of success, it's quite difficult to become financially stable. People can drop subs at any point in time if they so choose to do so. Uh, you might have loads of donations one month and then none the next. It, it can fluctuate quite heavily. So it takes quite a while before the curve going up reaches a level where you can kind of feel a lot more secure in what you're doing so we're going to ensure that you're building a foundation with which to build upon before just building that house and starting to live in it uh it's, it's the safest approach for you and it's the only way that really is sensible to go forward now you do control your success on twitch the actions that you perform as well you would expect uh, the things that really enhance your ability to succeed. But you do need to keep in mind that there is the element of luck in there. And it's undeniable. Uh, it's every, Everything's about sort of affecting your percentage chance of achieving what you want to do. Uh, a lot of good practices and the practices that we'll be covering across in this course will extremely raise that percentage chance but there's no such thing as 100% on Twitch. You may even get 99.99% .99 chance of something happening on Twitch, but there's always that element of luck, that element of just something going a little bit sideways on that occasion. So you do need to be aware of that. Don't be disheartened by the fact that the plans may not always pan out, but the more that you work at it and the more consistent that you become on the platform, the more likely you will be to achieve your goals and to really start pushing forwards and raising, as I say, that percentage chance of your success.
Now, before we really start getting through this course, it's super important to figure out what kind of streamer you want to be. So there are quite a lot of different types of streamer. Uh, the one that you'll most commonly see is just a variety streamer, which is basically I'll play anything and everything uh, as the game sort of come out. I'll just see what stuff really interests me and I'll start picking that up and playing through that. So you've got a real variety of different content moving through your channel. Uh, one day it might be an RPG, the next day it might be a, an FPS, the following week it might be an action game, you might be doing point and click the day after that. So it's, you know, whatever kind of tickles your particular interest that you can really bring your community to know and love. Uh, you may look to go down the single game focus, so you are really good at, let's say, Dota 2. Uh, you, you're really, really good. You, you know, you've you've got all of your strategy. Maybe you're working with a team or whatever else. So you'll focus on that game and you'll stream that either entirely, a hundred percent of the time, or you'll be streaming that like sort of ninety percent of the time with the odd extra bit thrown in, maybe when servers are down or you just feel like a little break or whatever else. Um, now those can be quite difficult to maintain. It's worth noting this quite early. Uh, so. The problem with doing single game is either the game loses popularity and therefore your stream loses popularity along with that as people are less interested in seeing that game played and then you need to kind of adapt very quickly and that can have sort of a big impact on your numbers or for yourself the game becomes a little stale for you you've played it 40 hours a week for the past year and that's just tiring for you now you've had enough of that game you're kind of sick to the teeth of it so it's well worth being aware of that possibility. Uh, you may be an esports orientated person as well, which again would probably lean on the single game style streamer more than anything else, but that's more on the sort of really high skill level. So you are super good. You're one of the best in the world at your particular game. And in that circumstance, uh, a lot of people are less focused on their community and more focused on just concentrating on the gameplay. Now, if you can find more of a balance with that, and you have the high level of gameplay and also can concentrate on your community too, you'll find that the people respond very well to that, because there's not that many people that do that, that have that really good balance uh, between the high quality gameplay and the really high quality community uh, interactions. Uh, a lot of variety game players, and this is not a knock on people that... Uh, do variety streaming they're not necessarily particularly good at the games they might you know make as many mistakes as you or I and uh, fail to see things as they're trying to progress through the game and that's fine because that's part of the joke and that's part of the fun um, whereas you know esports side is less likely to be accepted uh, now you can go down the sort of community focus as well uh, and this one's a little harder especially to sort of get started off with as well uh, doing a lot of community games, having open lobbies, or playing stuff like uh, Jackbox, which is fully, you know, sort of community uh, interaction. People join the game and you play together and whatever else. Now, obviously, if you're still starting out and you're at one or two viewers, you may not have enough people to fill a lobby and so forth. And you, so you will kind of need to have a plan B, because uh, even once you get going, there's always going to be quiet days. It it happens to the best of us. Some some days, you know, people just have other things that they need to be doing, and they don't turn up to the stream. So, uh, make sure if you do go down that lo uh, that route, you kind of have a plan B to work into place. Uh, now, another way that you can kind of provide your unique edge is to be like a gimmick streamer. So you have something that's really unique to yourself. So you're like Burke Black, who is a pirate, and he is constantly kind of in the persona of a pirate. He plays a lot of pirate-themed uh, games, and that's kind of his thing. Or Call of Cthulhu, who does uh, Cthulhu uh, Lovecraftian sort of style stuff, where it's all kind of eldritch horror. And he plays a lot of horror games, and that's kind of his whole aesthetic. Or the one Manny, who's literally a dog, and that's kind of his thing. He's just a dog on Twitch. He uses face rig to capture his webcam and turn himself into looking like a dog. And he dances around and screams and shouts, and it's it's, it's quite entertaining in a in a weird and wonderful way. And there's actually a really fantastic panel that was at a TwitchCon uh, a year or two ago now, and we'll have that link 
for you to go and have a look at that in the PDF for the activity that you've already taken a look at. Uh, definitely recommend giving that a watch if you are looking to go towards gimmicks because they are some of the best gimmick streamers on the platform. Uh, again, Burke Black, Call of Cthulhu, you've got General Mittens and, and another person whose name escapes me for the, for the moment on that panel who are all experts in their field. Definitely worth taking a look at there. And then, of course, you need to consider the fact that there are other aspects of Twitch as we spoke about a little bit earlier around uh, the start of the course which is your creative stuff, your music, your IRL, your talk shows. There are different elements of Twitch that you can really kind of run through and figure out what works for you. Maybe you're a really talented guitarist. Great. Start playing some on stream. Show people your talent. Take music requests. Uh, that can work really well for you. Um, there's a lot of different options you can go down there. Maybe you make products to sell. Uh, so you've got Imperial Girl, who's a fantastic streamer. She makes handbags, outfits, purses, but anything with fabric, basically, that you can sew together. She'll make it, and then those go up either on her Etsy store, or they're made for specific commissions, which is, again, something that Twitch supports. And you can, you can really start almost building a business alongside... Uh, the streaming side of it which again is going to be a potential revenue stream for you so uh, there's a lot of different options there and that's something that you want to try and put in place early on it's very difficult to transition from one to the other whilst you can be like say a variety streamer that occasionally plays your guitar on stream or occasionally does a little bit of art on stream or maybe you're an esports player six days of the week and then on the seventh day, you play some Mount Your Friends, which is stupidly fun, by the way. Um, you know, just as a sort of a spoofy break from what you normally do. Now, that's totally okay, having those sort of small breaks away. You'll probably still see some sort of a dip in viewers when you do so. But finding what your main focus is going to be is incredibly important because it will be difficult for you to deviate from that in the future. So uh, give it a lot of thought and make sure that you know who you you want to be and who you want to become on the platform well in advance of actually becoming that person. So in this first activity, we're going to cover over some of the basics. So we're going to set out some basic goals for you. So we're going to want to find out where you're going to be in one month, three months, six months, 12 months, two years down the line, where you see your audience being, where you see your content being, uh, whether there's any special goals that you have around streaming or using streaming to further yourself in a few different ways. Uh, let's start setting all of that stuff out. So you've got an idea of where to sort of point your content towards. Then we need to establish what kind of stream you're going to be. So you've probably got an idea of what kind of style that you're going to put across. The way you kind of carry yourself as an entertainer. So maybe you're going to be a chill streamer. Maybe you're going to be super community orientated. Maybe you're kind of an esports person. Play a lot of competitive gaming. Uh, maybe you're going to be an IRL streamer talking about your life, maybe you're going to do talk shows, maybe you're going to have gimmicks, uh, whatever it is that you feel that you're really good at, the unique edge that you can bring Twitch, then that is the sort of thing that you need to be kind of getting an idea of right now. So as you build and as you learn across this course, you can start seeing how the bits of advice you're going to receive will build together 
into the style of streamer that you're going to be. And of course, make sure that you really reinforce the fact that Twitch isn't an overnight success story. Uh, a lot of the time it takes a while to build. Um, going back to Ninja as an example uh, that we spoke about a little bit earlier on, it took him two years of streaming quite heavily before he started seeing the high level of success that he's seeing now. And that is something that you can see quite a lot across the platform. There are some people that really sort of go boom and straight start hitting it more or less immediately. But it's not particularly common. And there is a level of almost grind in there to get you started before you start seeing that success. So we're going to be making sure to put that behavior and that sort of knowledge in place for you. So if you pick up the PDF that's going to be attached here and start filling that out, it will start giving you, again, that sort of foundation, that, that base for you to start building upon and to start implementing all of the advice as it comes in, uh, compiling on top of that as well. The very first thing you have to do before you can even think about setting up a stream is you need to know if your internet is going to be capable of streaming. So my personal favorite site to use is called TestMyNet. Uh, this site is a little more accurate than a lot of the flash-based uh, browser tests. And so what you can do is you can check your download speed and your upload speed. Now for streaming, you're really concerned about upload. If you look in this corner up here, it'll tell you what server it's using. It's usually pretty good at guessing. So I'm on the east coast of the United States, so New York City is a great server for me to use. And I'm just going to quickly test my upload speed. And if for some reason it picks an odd server for you, you can adjust it. And there are other speed tests too. If you just Google speed tests, you should be able to find something that works fairly well. And so what this will do is it'll upload random data and then it'll tell you your speed. And so mine is 11.8, which is more than enough for streaming. You probably want something north of about four. You can stream with less than that. You just kind of have to lower some of your settings. But um, if you are on four, if you're below that, you might want to think about upgrading your internet package or just calling your ISP and talking to them and see if they can do anything about it. Once you have your upload all straightened out and uh, you figured out you, know, you will be able to stream with your internet, the next thing you need to do is make a Twitch account. Now, before you can make a Twitch account, you need to come up with a username. This is really important because this is how people are going to identify you. Now, Twitch does allow you to change usernames uh, every so often if you need to, but it's better to just start out with something you like. So there's a couple guidelines for the best way to pick a username. The first one, obviously, is to check and see if it's taken. So if you really want to be, um, you know, say say Shroud, you love, you love the name Shroud. Sorry, he's a really popular streamer, and uh, that's, that's not going to happen. So you need to take whatever username you think is going to be cool um, and, and just kind of check. So check Twitter and check Facebook and go go looking and see so you know if you look up shroud twitch you're going to see all kinds of clips his stream he's got you know twitter account everything like that so that that username is out now once you pick a username that you like that isn't taken uh, you need to think about is it too similar to a really popular broadcaster uh, so say you want something like oh my god it's danny or, oh my god, it's, yeah, let's do, oh my god, it's Firefly, right? This username is incredibly similar to the very popular streamer, oh my god, it's Firefox. 
you probably do not want to pick a name that is really, really close to somebody who is already established. The same thing like if you wanted to be Dr. Respect instead of Dr. Disrespect. You want to pick something that is unique and that people will not confuse you for someone who's already rather popular and successful. You want to have your own brand and not kind of, you know, be associated with someone else. Now the next thing that you want to decide is... Um, Think about how you're spelling your username and if it's going to, uh, if people are going to be able to hear it and type it in. And so mine is Renessa. So I use all letters, it's normal. It's fairly easy to spell. But if I wanted to be tricky and put a one in place of the I, or maybe an at symbol, and then became Renessa, but with different symbols, that makes it really hard for me to tell people, oh, hi, I'm Renessa. They can't go and find me like that. But if I spell it normally, it's pretty easy to see all of my information pop up and people can actually find my accounts. Um, so this can be really important for networking or if someone gives you a shout out or even just, just building your name recognition and building your community. The next thing that you need to think about is... Uh, is it a professional name? So if your username is 420 Booty Wizard, which um, is actually someone from Dota, which is how I had that pop into my head, uh, you need to think about the fact in the future, are you going to be looking at sponsorships? Do you want to partner with game development companies? Do you want to be hosting things or present as guests at events? If your name that you choose is... Uh, perhaps not the best for, for mainstream sponsors and uh, partnerships and things like that. You might want to change it to something that's going to have a little more, you know, long-term appropriateness in the scene. Now, if you're just looking to casually stream and have fun with friends and you're never looking to take it another step, choose whatever you want. And then the very last step is to take your username and Google it. Are you okay with what pops up? Are you okay with when people go and look up this username, even if there's something completely unrelated to your presence on Twitch and social media, are you okay with what shows up when you Google that? Once you've done all of those steps, it is time to head over to Twitch. So we land on the main page, we see some nice featured streams, and up in this upper right hand corner there is a sign up button. And so when you sign up on Twitch, you're going to type in whatever username that you have come up with. You come up with a password, entering your birthday, so you have to, I believe you have to be 13, and an email. So when you come up with your username, you should head right over to Gmail and make an email account from that username. And that is as simple as it is to create a Twitch account, is to just enter in all of your details, and, uh, and then you have your own Twitch account. So I've logged in with my account and uh, it's a very good idea to set up two-factor authentication uh, when you set up your Twitch account just in case to make sure nobody can kind of get at your account and take away your stream from you. Once you've created your Twitch account, you're going to land on the home page of Twitch right here. And so the first thing you're going to want to do is head into your settings. In your settings, you're going to see the email that you have signed up with. Um, and have the ability to upload a profile picture and put in a short bio about yourself. Uh, so this is just a great way to really kind of just let people know who you are right off the bat. The next thing that you want to do is head in and set up two-factor authentication. Now I already have it set up on my account, um, but this is in your security and privacy settings. So this is just really important to make sure that your account stays protected and you can just link it up to your phone and when you log into Twitch from a new device, it'll just send you a code through text message and there's also an app um, if you want to you know, not be tied to to cell phone carrier settings and you want to be able to you know, use an app, say if you're in another country, um, that's also an option. And you really just want to set that up so that you have two-factor. That's just kind of a safe way to do it. And so those are the two kind of really important first steps when you're setting up your profile. Uh, later on, we will discuss where to find um, your, your stream key for actually streaming with Twitch and everything. But this is how you get started. Um, just putting in a little bio, a picture about yourself so that people can get to know you before your first stream starts.
Once you have your account set up and uh, you're looking to be ready to start streaming, you're going to have to make a decision about what software to use to actually stream with. Now, there's two main choices. There's something called XSplit and then there's something called OBS. So XSplit has a free version, but it's very minimal. You are limited on quality settings and then a few other options. But it's very, very straightforward and simple to use. So if you do choose to pay for it, you are kind of paying for ease of access and, and simpleness with it. It has a lot more scene transition options when you're going between, say, your, your waiting screen, your gaming, your BRB, etc. There's a lot more transition options for that. Because it is a service that you pay for, and it's funded, um, that development leads to a lot faster capture device support. So you will see XSplit might be a little faster on keeping up with streaming trends. And then one of the other advantages of it, uh, which this, this really depends on you personally, uh, it can directly capture Skype video instead of having to do window capture. So if you are doing um, interviews or, or podcast type things or some kind of co-streaming thing where it's really important to you to have multiple camera views up, XSplit can be really helpful because it captures Skype video if you still use Skype. So OBS is the other software. Uh, I think this is the one that, that most people are going to be familiar with. It is completely free. Uh, so a lot of people tend to start out with OBS just because it is free. It's not terribly challenging to use, um, and we will go over both of these software, how to set them up and how to use them for streaming. OBS has ample documentation. Um, any kind of problem you're having, you're probably going to be able to find it in a forum online if you're having any issues with it. It has um, a lot of really nice built-in filters. So if you are green screening, it has very easy options to kind of filter out the green from the background. It also has some really nice audio processing options, and uh, they are also working on really great integrations with bots and other streaming tools. So OBS is um, it's what I personally use, and it's definitely what I would I would choose to use, uh, having having been using it for four or five years now. Um, so some of the drawbacks for these two software, the main thing for XSplit is that you do have to pay for it, uh, whereas OBS is free. And then kind of the drawbacks of OBS is um, because it's free, it may not update as quickly. And some of the updates that they roll out can be a little bit unstable. So OBS can sometimes require a little more troubleshooting. To be honest, that troubleshooting is a thing of the past. OBS has been very smooth and easy to work with. Um, but that being said, we will be going over how to use both of these uh, software types, and then you can pick which one is going to work the best for your needs. Welcome to lecture three of setting up your stream. So this is going to cover how to set up OBS, which is one of the broadcasting software that we spoke about. So you are going to head to obsproject.com and here you can download your software for whichever operating system you're currently using. So most of us are probably using Windows software. So we're going to click Windows, download OBS, and uh, then you're going to just double click it from the downloads in your browser and let it install. Once OBS is installed, just click and open it right up, and this is the window that you're going to come up to. So it'll just be black. We haven't added any scenes or sources or any information to it yet. So the first thing we're going to do is add a new scene. To do this, we just right click down in the bottom left and click Add. And then when we go to add the scene, you can name it whatever you want. So uh, I'm going to call this one Gaming. So once we've added this gaming scene, we're going to add sources. So sources are what people actually see 
uh, when you are streaming. So you add different sources, whether it's um, an image source for your overlay, a gaming source so people can see the game you're playing, a camera source, any other text or anything you want to add. These are all in your sources for each scene. So you can make different scenes uh, for different styles of setup and then you add your sources to each of those scenes. The first thing we're gonna add is a game capture. And again, it's the same, you click to add it and you can name it whatever you want. My video game of choice is Dota 2. Um, and make sure that you have launched the game that you wanna add uh, before you do this step. It makes it a lot easier to set up. So if you look down in my system tray, I already have Dota launched, which is great, so I can now add this scene. Um, and when I get to the properties window for this, I want to capture a specific window. And so I pick the Dota 2 window specifically that I am capturing. And once I do this, it adds Dota as a source for me. Uh, and so here, you know, I just see the landing page in the Dota 2 UI. And so the next thing we want to do is add a video capture. So it's gonna work exactly the same as adding a gaming capture, uh, but you select video capture device instead of game capture. And then I've just named it webcam here, and uh, I've made a ridiculous face while taking the screenshot. Um, but so I use a Logitech C920. Um, so that's the device I have selected here. And I just leave everything set to default. You can mess around with things. You can configure your video. You can change your resolution. Um, there's a lot of options here, but the default works just fine for this webcam. And once I hit OK, it adds the source and you can resize it, as, which is what I've done here. So I've made it smaller so it doesn't block as much of the game. And then another really cool trick is if you hold down Alt and click any of these little bubbles on the side, you can actually crop your sources. And this works for any source, not just webcams. So you can crop it in smaller um, or bigger, uh, depending on how you want to use the alt cropping. This can be really nice if you have uh, a source that has some kind of extra thing on the side, or if you're doing a monitor capture and you don't want people to see your system tray. Um, so there's some really nice alt cropping options there. And that's just a really good tool to remember to use. Now the next thing that you have to do with setting up your OBS is you actually have to get ready to stream it. So this uh, lecture is about how to stream on Twitch. Um, so I'm gonna show you how to find the settings you need to be able to stream from OBS to Twitch. So you're gonna have to bend back over to your Twitch account that we created earlier. And in the upper right hand corner, you will see an option called dashboard. So if you click on your dashboard, you are going to use the left-hand navigation panel and click channel. And in your channel, you will see something called a stream key. So I am not going to show you mine. These are private, they're individual for every single broadcaster, but you're going to click on your stream key and then you wanna say show key. It's gonna pop up a little window that says, are you sure you want to show this? Yes, you are, uh, but I, that's again why I'm not showing you mine. And don't share this with anybody because this is a unique key that streams to your individual channel and anyone who has the key can indeed stream to your channel. If you ever feel like you have accidentally shared your stream key, there is a reset stream key option. Um, that's very easy. So if you are ever worried about someone having access to your stream, just reset your stream key and re-input it into ops. So once you have the key, you're just gonna copy it, and I will show you where to put it right into OBS afterwards. When you're in OBS, you're gonna go back to this main screen and you're gonna click on settings. This is what your settings menu looks like, and so you wanna go one down on the left and click stream. And so here you're gonna select your services Twitch. It will auto select servers. If you are ever having server problems, you can click on this and pick specific servers. Uh, just look at the cities they have available and try and pick one close to you. And then here is where you copy paste in your stream key. Now this will automatically just be a bunch of asterisks or bullet points um, and you can hit show if you wanna see the actual letters and numbers at any point. And so you are technically set up to stream on Twitch. There are a few other settings you're gonna to wanna to go and look at first before you stream. The first one, you may have noticed in the bottom tray but you don't actually have any audio inputs yet. So you wanna to head to the audio section and uh, you can just choose default for desktop audio. This means that any game sound that you are listening to 
Um, so any game sound, any music, anything like that, that's your desktop audio. And this is just telling OBS where to pull desktop audio from. And the next setting that you want to do is going to be your microphone. Um, so depending on which microphone you want to use, you're going to see the same drop down menu and you can pick which microphone you want OBS to pick up. And you do have options for multiple microphones here. Um, so you can pick whichever one you want OBS to use specifically. And the next thing is to head over to your video settings. Here uh, you want to, most of us have a base resolution of 1920 um, by 1080. When you first start out streaming on Twitch, you usually won't have any quality options on your stream, which means asking people to stream 1080p uh, with you know 60 FPS is asking a lot of their internet, and you might lose a lot of viewers just because your internet isn't really good enough to stream, uh, at, or their internet isn't really good enough to stream at that high of a quality. Uh, so what I would recommend is downscale to 720p and only stream at 30 FPS. This will allow people with slightly less good internet to still watch you, but your quality really shouldn't suffer too much. Watching at 720 should be you know, pretty good for most people. One last little thing that's useful, if you look at your sources, they have little eyes next to them. If you ever want to turn off a source, say you are eating something or something is not functioning the way you expect, just click the little eye and it'll hide it, like I have now hidden my webcam here. That is it for the basics of how to set up your OBS software. You're pretty much ready to start streaming on Twitch once we get you set up with equipment, which we'll talk about in some later lectures. Hello there, so we're going to talk around XSplit a little. So I'm the only one out of the team here that actually uses XSplit, but I, I've got a bit of a love for it. I, I prefer it. I find it a lot more simplistic than OBS for the most part, but that's just personal taste. Uh, honestly, there are pros and cons of both, and I'm here to show you the ones around XSplit, obviously. So first and foremost, let's look at our base settings. So uh, the way that the stream is overall going to look and feel. So we're going to take a look at Senshudo settings, as that's my channel, and you should totally be following it. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, subtle plug. Uh, so we've got a username in there, and you've got two methods of kind of authenticating yourself with the live streaming program. So you can either do web authentication, which is effectively giving you the ability to just sort of log in to your account, and that will give Expert all the permission it needs to live stream. Or you can use a stream key, which I put uh, X's in here for the moment, uh, because it does just show your stream key. And as much as I'm sure you're all lovely, I don't want you streaming on my account. <laughs> so I've X'd them out. So do be careful if you're showing this screen up on stream, as it will actually uh, show this as uh, clear text. And it won't blank it out or anything like that. Uh, either is fine, honestly. It doesn't make terribly much difference between uh, which ones you use. Uh, now you would pick your server that you want to stream to so on Twitch you've got a hell of a lot of different servers uh, I mean for example Helsinki is a brand new one that I've never seen before uh, now you want to choose a server that kind of has the best ratings across the board so the lower the number the better the first two columns here show the the last ping and the average ping that you receive from that server and then the jitter is kind of the basically the stability of that uh, particular server for you, how consistent it is with the the information you're sending and receiving to it. So I personally actually don't even stream to the one closest to me, which would be London. I typically stream to Amsterdam and Frankfurt because I find that they are typically more uh, reliable for me. 
Uh, you may find that it's worth playing around and taking a look at a couple of different servers that are near to you, but typically aim for ones that are near to you, as they will have the lowest ping on average. Now, for video encoding, you've got a couple of options here usually. Uh, X264 uses your processor, uh, and NVENC it uses your graphics card. Obviously, if you're running on NVIDIA, those are the options that I have available, because I am. Uh, typically, you will want to run on uh, X264 unless you have a pretty high power rig. Um, you may want to look up some different literature on the pros and cons of those. Uh, but I, I would typically recommend using X264. You can also have some desync issues with your audio when using uh, NVIDIA's encoding. So uh, just be aware of that. Uh, now, your bit rate uh, will vary based on your, your audience, but typically, uh, I would go no higher than 2,500 or, or possibly even 2,000, but 2,500 looks very good at uh, 720p, which is what video size that we have set here. And I would, again, heavily recommend that you use 720p. <laughs> so you have the ability to edit that in there. Um, we use 3,000 because we're a partner channel, so we, we, ha we have less uh, trouble with encoding uh, uh, on the Twitch side. So Twitch give... Uh, different encoding options uh, once you reach a certain size and if you're a partner you automatically get them which allows people to watch your video at varying qualities but when you're starting out you won't have those options so you want to try and cater for as many people as humanly possible and then you've got uh, a mode setting here which you want to leave on CBR for compatibility with Twitch uh, I honestly don't know which which is which uh, because I've never needed to because CBR is uh, what Twitch runs on or Twitch accepts. Now, your max keyframe interval should always be two. Uh, that is uh, mandated by Twitch's servers, and they will not let you stream to their service unless it's two or below. Uh, so I would I would recommend just using two because that's what they recommend as well. Uh, your encoder preset. Now, this is basically how fast your CPU works uh, to try and you know put together the stream and try and smooth out the quality of what it's sending out to Twitch. Now, very fast is the average. Uh, that is the one that most people will end up using, uh, unless they have like a dedicated streaming setup with a very, very good CPU in it. Because uh, you, you can see the warnings here as well. You know, don't try it without like super good ones. Don't try it without a monster CPU, which would probably be like the high-end Ryzen chip at this point in time, uh, which is basically built for... Um, for encoding video uh, or encoding media in general. Uh, your buffer should equal your bitrate on in general as well uh, and then you've got your video size here so you can set your FPS but your FPS should be set to 30 anyway which is uh, your default stage anyway um, and then your video size you can set here as well uh, which is going to be the quality you're sending out to Twitch. Um, audio encoding for the most part just leave it alone to where it is uh, by standard 128 is a pretty good quality for audio um, and that's pretty much everything covered off on this part here now if we're setting up our scenes uh, you've got the the ability to have as many scenes as you want in the bottom right hand corner here uh, there's a well I mean I've, I've put a bunch here for demonstration purposes and there's a few sort of spoofy bits and pieces that I've put together here um, now you can change your transitions between moving uh, from one scene to the next I think a fade is fine for the most part but if you want to try and do something a little bit flashy you've got a bunch of standard options here plus the addition of things called stingers which are kind of like almost a little video transition between one scene and the next and again that requires a little bit of advanced knowledge uh, so we won't touch on that here for the moment um, so you can build up your scene quite easily so, for example, uh, what we have here is a screen capture. Screen capture is pretty useful. It's quite bad for dropping frames uh, on various different games, but it's kind of your, your last resort. If you can't get a game to capture in any way, shape, or form, you can use screen capture. Now, if you, I just click at this point in time, it will capture this entire monitor. Uh, so whatever monitor this little red cross is active on, it will capture the entirety of that, or I can sort of crop it's almost like a cropping action I guess I can crop a section of the screen and it will just pick up that one part in whatever active program that I am cropping into so I could do this on Chrome I could do this on 
uh, notepad if I really wanted to. It doesn't matter. Like I can just cr crop any uh, program that I like and just have that part in there. So it's quite useful for perhaps hiding a bit of sensitive information or just you know getting some extra crap out of the way. Maybe you've got the browser bar on a browser and you want to show that off. Maybe just clip out the browser bar so that's not showing up all of your favorites and whatever else. Uh, so you've got that option there. Now, uh, next up we've got uh, adding different games. So if you go here, obviously we've got no games open at the moment. So uh, we're, there's none listed there, but they would be normally listed down there. Any games that you've got running at that point in time on this machine, you can just simply click that game. And in much in the same way as you have the desktop region here, the game will just show up in a small sort of uh, rectangle here. And you can begin to just tease it about and resize as you wish uh, to make it fit however you want it to, perhaps within a layout or or whatever it is that you're doing. Let's get rid of that again because that's making me feel a little bit nauseous. Um, and then adding devices, you can add your webcam, say, or you know if you've got face rig, you can add that in there. Uh, whatever devices that you've got as far as video is concerned you can add those in. My webcam's not currently hooked up, which is why that's not coming up as an option. My capture card is. Um, and then as far as audio is concerned, you can actually add audio into specific scenes as opposed to adding them into the entire program, which does provide a little bit of uh, differentiation. Uh, text, you can just add in uh, text like I have done already here and add different effects onto it. I mean, if you're familiar with... Uh, various different word processing programs you'll be familiar with most of the options that are here the different colors and bits and pieces you can chroma key out certain things if you wanted to you've, you've got a hell of a lot of different options here and, and for the most part it just makes sense to play around with them uh, so i would strongly suggest doing exactly that uh, to get you know the desired results you know do you want to flip it round or rotate or whatever else you can you can play around with those to your heart's content uh, you can add a web page so that's uh, for your alerts for the most part you would be using a web page of some description uh, so what that basically means is a URL so if we go to this screen here uh, you'll see it appear there we go uh, the tip jar that I have here from Streamlabs which we'll cover over in another section uh, is actually just a URL that gets sent from uh, Streamlabs so you can put into your capture program and that's all that is it just adds it in under that basis and again you get a lot of similar options here to play around with it and change colors and the way it looks and flip it around and whatever it is that you want to do and don't mind my uh, natty screen here for my intro it's not the one i directly use at the moment <laughs> it's just what i have on this pc uh, so let's come back across to over here um you can also add media files which just goes to your file manager and lets you add pictures videos whatever it is as far as media is concerned into your stream so you can see here i've got uh some two pound coins uh which is which are lovely uh so we can uh, play around again in the same way with all these different options flip it around chroma key out the background if we were so inclined uh whatever it is there it's quite easy and again you know as with everything on this you can resize as much as you like uh to make them fit into your layout uh nice and easy uh, streams, honestly, if you're looking at using streams, you probably know a lot more about XSplit than even I do. So uh, I won't be entering into that at this point in time. Uh, if Honestly, if you know how to set up half of these things, uh, message me. <laughs> and then uh, extra widgets that you can add in as well. Uh, you've got an image slideshow. So if you wanted to have like rotating sets of pictures going around, for example, you would use the image slideshow to achieve that and add multiple pictures into there. If you wanted to capture Skype video directly from Skype as opposed to capturing the little bits of Skype and trying to squeeze them in place, uh, you've got the option to actually pull those individual feeds across. That's one of the unique features of XSplit. Uh, it makes it very nice and easy. You don't have to worry about people hanging up and messing up your layout and that kind of stuff. Uh, very nice little feature. Uh, your video playlist is there for um, the same reason as the image slideshows there. You can just add loads of videos in and it's all nice and easy. And then your whiteboard is just something for you to be able to scribble on on screen. Now the other thing that you'll probably want to look at uh, are in the options next to the audio here. Now you can play around with uh, being able to preview your audio, your audio which I, I wouldn't recommend. 
uh, it'll be quite echoey and honestly as much as anything you just need to experiment with volume levels uh, this is what I run on as my audio levels you can see how far my voice is coming up on the the meter at the bottom here now my game audio comes up to like here but I am still aud audible way over my game audio go figure uh, in any capture program uh, they're, they're not very reflective and you do just need to experiment around do a few recordings to try and find a good balance uh, it's one of the plagues of streaming unfortunately uh, so the system sound is what XSplit is going to pick up as your sound so whatever your default audio device is enter that in there uh, and same with your microphone that's what XSplit is going to be hearing as an entire program all the way across you can add delays onto them but unless you need to uh, I, I wouldn't recommend doing it and you also have silence detection which is like a noise gate so that would allow you to automatically let things close off uh, your audio close off when you're not speaking to not pick up so much background noise uh, that requires a lot of fiddling around with and experimentation it's good if you can put it on there but it's not super super required um, and that is about it and then, uh, most of the other options aren't that important you can use hotkeys key, hot to bind different sources and different uh, scenes and what have you to your keyboard if you were so inclined um, it's probably quite useful to have some of those done if you do have the keys to spare that you aren't likely to be hitting during a game uh, if you have a stream deck uh, which perhaps most of you might not have but it's basically a little board with buttons on that you can use to switch between uh, scenes that actually hooks directly into XSplit already so uh, you can just use that directly um, but beyond that that's pretty much the overview of XSplit so the the real perks of it are its simplicity uh, it, it works a lot more easily than OBS it tends to have a lot more compatibility with different programs different games different pieces of hardware uh, especially like capture cards and, what, uh, and bits like that so OBS as a free project has trouble keeping up with the new hardware that's released Whereas XSplit is a funded thing, obviously you need to pay for XSplit subscription. So it does differentiate it a little bit there. Uh, with the subscription, they're able to invest in developing uh, linkages for different uh, bits of hardware and, and pieces like that. Uh, you've got the thing with the Skype video there as well, which is somewhat useful, but not super, super critical. Uh, and personally, I just find it more useful to navigate around and to switch into quickly it tends for me it has less errors uh, I, I tend to have less crashes with XSplit than I do with OBS not to say that OBS is a super unreliable service and crashes all the time but I would say on average it does crash more often than XSplit does uh, but that's about the rough overview that should be getting you started with XSplit and getting you to put your own elements in there have a play around with it have an experiment with a few different options a few different bits and pieces here and there and hopefully you'll find this starts working out for you pretty well there is a free option available from XSplit's website which gives you some limited functionality uh, you can get by by using that perfectly fine uh, I would strongly recommend going to the uh, subscription one which isn't terribly expensive uh, it, it, it only works out to a few pounds a month or whatever your local currency is uh, and it really to me if you want to make a slicker stream and have a bit of an easier time of it it's worth the investment if you're looking into this long term Welcome to lecture five, where we will be covering how to use Streamlabs. 
Streamlabs is one of the main ways that broadcasters have all of their alerts, donations, um, and all of those follower, subscriber, everything like that is all set up through Streamlabs. So the first thing that you need to do is head over to streamlabs.com. And from here, you're going to log into your account. So I log in with Twitch when I use mine because I am a Twitch streamer. And this takes me to my dashboard. So on my dashboard, I can see uh, my donations from today, uh, follows, subscriptions that I've had, and then I also see a long recent events list of people who have followed, subscribed, donated bits, anything like that. The first thing that you're going to want to do really when you set this up is to head over to your alert box. So your alert box is how you set up all of your custom alerts for your stream. So the first thing that you have are a few just general settings here. You can add a slight delay to the alerts so that they don't happen immediately. And you can choose the layout you want in general for all of your alerts. So most people use some kind of image and then text that says what the alert actually is. And so my chosen style of image is I have an image with text that goes over it, but you can do an image next to text or you can do an image on top of text. And then you have the options to individually customize each of these. And so you can choose alert animations. Um, you can actually enable or even disable these alerts. Uh, so that's, that's up to you if you want to show them or not. You can choose a message template. Now anything that's bracketed means that it will change based on who it is that follows, subscribes, donates, etc. Uh, so pay attention to what the bracketed things are because you want to use them as the, the wild cards in these settings so that people's individual names actually get used. Now one of the really cool things here is you have the option to upload your own personal image. And so I created a specific image that goes with my stream aesthetic and design, um, and it says new follower right on it. So, and then the text will pop up here over the image. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of test testing to make sure that the text shows up in the right spot, uh, but it is, it is a really nice effect. So if you want to add your own images, you can drag and drop from your computer to upload, or you can click here and just choose somewhere on your PC to upload. So you can see it saved a lot of my images over time. Um, so I've had some fall specific ones. I used to have a different banner um, with some, you can use GIFs for these as well. They don't have to be static images. I've got Easter ones um, and a few game specific things. So I changed my alerts around quite a bit so that people have fun with them. But for now, I am sticking with this banner, which you can see a couple of them here. Um, and it will save a lot of your images. It takes, you have one gigabyte of space. I have tons of images uploaded and I'm only at 26 megabytes. So I could continue uploading things for a while. You can also upload custom sound. So you have a lot of different sounds. Um, one time I had a, a custom stream that was cosplaying a certain character. So I had this sound play for my follower sounds. A divine infusion. Um, so you can pick whatever sounds you want to help kind of go along with your stream, or you can have no sound at all, depending on how you want to run your alerts. You can also do variations uh, where you have it set randomly, um, and it's just an alert that looks differently. So you can choose different images, different text colors, different sounds, and vary things up so people aren't hearing the same alert over and over again. And this is the same for subscriptions, donations, hosts, bits, and rates. So you have the option to customize all of these. You'll have variations for them. Um, and you have a lot of options to make your alerts your own and kind of add a unique stream element um, to everything that you're doing. And the next thing to set up is uh, donations. Now, some of us are streaming for fun. Some of us are streaming to make money. That's, that's up to the individual person to decide what their stream is for. But a lot of people really like to show their appreciation for your entertainment by donating to you. So you're going to set this up by going to donation settings. And uh, the main way that everybody does this is they connect a PayPal. So you just make yourself a PayPal account and you can head right to Streamlabs and uh, mine is already connected, but you would just click on here, log into your PayPal, and then you'll receive donations that way. 
An important note to realize is whatever actual name you put on your PayPal account will be visible to people. So if you want to protect your own personal name, uh, do not sign up for PayPal with your actual name. Sign up with something related to your stream. And so in my case, I named mine Renessa Dota because my stream name is Renessa and I play a lot of Dota. And that way people don't see my personal information. Uh, you can also link these, these other things. Now, I have not linked these yet, but that is up to the individual person, whether or not you want to allow credit card donations or other forms of donations. And then once you actually have this set up, you go back to the alert box and uh, you can set up all kinds of cool donation alerts. So for mine, I actually have different variations where you can do specific amounts and um, mine play different funny songs based on the amount that my viewers know about. Uh, so that can be a fun way to do it. You can also do special sounds, say, for the largest donation of the day, um, and you can just randomize them again so people aren't hearing the same thing over and over again. These, these variations were an excellent addition to Streamlabs. Now, something else really cool that you can do is you can actually connect multiple accounts. So if you head over to Account Settings, I have my Twitch linked, but I also have my YouTube linked. If I go to my alert box and then I click this little Twitch icon up in the corner, I can select YouTube. And now I can set custom alerts for YouTube. And so I have YouTube subscribers set up as its own custom alert so that if people are watching my stream and they go and they follow me on YouTube, which in that case is called a subscription, they will still get an alert on my live stream. And this is just to help encourage people to also use my YouTube, which is really nice. Uh, because YouTube and Twitch will kind of feed off of each other. And as a streamer, it's really good to have different forms of content creation. Now, the sidebar has a lot of really cool additional tools, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, uh, but they are just fun to explore. Streamlabs is, they come up with new things all the time. They are very inventive, and they really do a lot of things to help out streamers and make streams much more customizable. So my new favorite one actually is credits. I've been using credits a lot. And here it will record people who donate, people who follow, people who subscribe. It will thank your moderators for you. Um, and so I have mine set up to be a nice, uh, a nice Star Wars theme here. Um, but you can, you can choose, again, customize just like all your alerts. And you're going to hit roll credits live at any point when you want to roll it on your stream. So this can be something really, really nice to do at the end of the stream to kind of thank everybody uh, for moderating, following, subscribing, donating, etc. And so there's other uh, tools over here like the jar. Um, so this is just an image you put on your stream and the more people that interact with your stream, follow, donate, sub, whatever you want to choose, it will fill up the jar to incentivize people again to fill up whatever glass jar type that you choose. And now the last one, is this is called stream labels. Now this is something that's going to be a very useful tool. So stream labels um, is something that you download. And so Windows or Mac are the two that they support. And when you download it, it will ask you to set up a folder. Pay attention to where you put this folder. Uh, it will be important later on. Um, but this is, this is how people have the most recent follower, the most recent donator, top donators, um, most recent subscriber, all of those texts things that you see when you're watching your favorite broadcaster. Um, this is all most of the time powered through stream labels. If they're using Streamlabs, it's going to be powered through stream labels. So you're going to download the software and uh, it's just double click to set it up and choose a save file. And once you do that, we're going to head back into OBS and I will show you how to set up um, your stream labels. All right, so now that you have stream labels installed and set up, you're going to head into OBS and you're going to add a new source just like we did before, but this time you're going to add a text source. And when you go into the properties for your text source, which I in this case have named followers, you want to check the little box that says read from file. And then we're going to browse and actually find the file. And this is why it's important to remember where you set up that folder. And so I have a folder called OBS inputs. And I put my stream labels folder here. And in my stream labels folder, there are all kinds of different options that are text documents. 
and the software that you downloaded, which you have to make sure is open and running while you're streaming, will automatically update these text documents anytime you have a new follower, subscriber, donation, etc. So if we are setting up to show the most recent follower, we're going to click most recent follower here and hit OK, and it, the text will automatically go to the top part of the screen. And you can drag it to move it around, resize, and uh, you can always go back to the follower source and change you know, the, the type of font, um, the sizing, anything like that that you need to. And you can add as many of these as you want. Uh, there are tons and tons of options in that stream labels folder. So you can decide what works for your stream and what you want to add into your sources um, to kind of acknowledge the people who are supporting your stream. Once you have all of your alerts set up, you have maybe you want to show a live viewer count, maybe you want to show a chat box, you know, whatever parts of stream labels Whatever parts of Streamlab that uh, appeal to you, that you want to add to your stream, I'm going to show you quickly how to actually put them into OBS. So the way to do this is uh, you go to whatever it is once you have it all set up. And even you've noticed at the top of each of these, there is something called a widget URL. So you can copy it. And I don't even actually have to show it. That means I can just copy it. And then we are going to head back into OBS and add this as another source. And then once you add it as a source, again, you can resize and change it in OBS um, and add it to as many scenes as you want. And you can do this with any of these widgets. So all of these widgets have the same option where you can just copy the URL and you can add it directly to OBS. And the way to do this is the same as everything else that we've done, very simple. You're going to add another source uh, to your scene. And in this case, we are adding something called a browser source. And once you add your browser source, you just copy, paste, whatever your widget is, into the browser source and resize, alt crop, you know, whatever it is you need to do to add it to your scenes. So it's very simple. And that's one of the great things about OBS is once you get the basics, it is incredibly simple to um, add all these things. They've made it very easy to understand. And that is it for how to set up Streamlabs. So go ahead when you have some time and really explore this website, get used to all the different settings and figure out what things you really want to include in your stream and what is going to benefit you and your aesthetic. Make sure to check this website often and see what cool new things that they have added, conveniently highlighted as new. And uh, don't forget that Streamlabs is gonna keep innovating and that's gonna allow you as a creator to keep innovating yourself and really take advantage of this great uh, tool that you have for setting up your stream and making it better. Welcome to our sixth lecture, which is going to discuss cameras. Now, not every Twitch stream has to have a camera, but I have found that I personally enjoy streams where I kind of get to see the broadcaster reaction to things. So it is a good thing to at least consider whether or not you want to have a camera with your stream. Again, it's not required, but for a lot of people, it can be very nice to kind of connect with the broadcaster and follow along with their emotions, trials, everything else so you can see played out on their face. And so if you choose to have a stream with a camera, there are, there's a few options here, but pretty much everyone is going to go with 
the tried and trusted C920 from Logitech. That is what most streamers use. It is an amazing camera. It's what I'm currently using now. And uh, it really, it just works great for streaming. It has a lot of different options in it. You can adjust your brightness, your contrast, your color intensity. Uh, I've had fun doing black and white streams by lowering the saturation all the way. So you have a lot of different options for it. It is a plug and play webcam that is incredibly easy to use and has great quality, absolutely wonderful quality. Um, so that's gonna be my recommendation. There are other webcams out there. If you already have a webcam, that's probably just fine to start with. Um, but if you're looking to buy one, C920 is kind of, I can't really say gold standard, but uh, it's amazing. And the reason I'm not saying gold standard is because there are things such as production cameras, cameras that uh, TV studios and uh, esports production companies and et cetera use. These are really not worth it. Not at all, unless you already have one. If you already have one and you know how to set it up and you know how to use it and everything, that's wonderful. You'll have amazing stream video quality. But if you are just looking to kind of buy the basics, C920s will work for pretty much even the highest end streams. That's still what a lot of people are using. So it's just a great investment and it's a really nice webcam. Now, one of the things that really does push your webcam to the next level and why kind of the webcam itself doesn't matter that much, is you really want to think about your lighting. So if you kind of look at me right now, I, I have a lot of light on me. I, I do. I'm using quite a bit of lighting to make sure that everything is just well lit, the camera has to do the least amount of work possible, and the image is as, as crisp and uh, honestly makes me look good. Good lighting makes you look good. And so there's a few ways to do this, some more expensive than others. If you look, um, a lot of YouTubers and some streamers have something called a diva light. And uh, <laughs> what this is, it is a circle of very, very bright white LEDs that you can put different filters over depending on how you want it to look. And these can run anywhere from maybe around $100 to $300. Um, they sit on a tripod and you can put it right behind your webcam and you will have very, very good lighting that makes your skin look great and you'll look awake and bright and alert and happy to be there all the time. Um, so those, those can be a little more on the expensive end, but they are a pretty good investment and it will always make your camera quality look better. Uh, what I am currently using are called soft boxes. So these you can buy in photography setups. And again, it's a hundred to $200. Um, and they are, if you've ever seen a photo shoot where you've seen the kind of the umbrellas that reflect light, or you've seen the big rectangle uh, boxes of just bright white light, that's what I'm currently using. Um, and they are called soft boxes. Those are wonderful. Uh, I believe mine have like eight LED bulbs in each of them and they're very bright. Uh, but it's actually probably better for my eyes while I'm gaming to not be stressed. And then it's better for my viewers because they get to see me in full light. Now, both of these options that I've mentioned are kind of expensive. Uh, so they aren't necessarily what you want to go with if you're just setting up your stream or just kind of testing the waters. They might be a later investment. Something I've found that is a very, very cheap but very effective way to get good lighting are to buy bright white LED bulbs. So these are a few dollars a bulb and they are incredibly bright. Um, I don't recommend them for lighting all over your house because you'll never be able to sleep, but in your streaming area, they are amazing. And so if you have an overhead light, you can put these bright white LED bulbs in them, or if you buy a tall floor lamp, you can um, take the lampshade off of it and then just have the bulb emitting very bright light, and that'll help illuminate you and just make your camera settings a lot better. Now, once you have great lighting, you have your camera set up, you've added the source to OBS like we showed you in a previous lecture, uh, there's one last thing you need to think about, and that is your background. So people do not want to see dirty laundry, a messy bed, those things. Fine for you if you want to, but if you are looking to make your stream as successful as possible, it can be a very good idea to take five minutes just to think about your background. So if we look at mine right now, I am a Dota player, so I have a variety of Dota 
paraphernalia all sitting here kind of showing off all the, from different events I've been to. It gives people something to connect to when they come to my stream. They see it, they recognize it, and they think, yes, this person's another crazy Dota fan like me. Um, I have a whiteboard up that I can put people who subscribe or donate just to kind of thank them and give them recognition for supporting me, and they really like that. And then if you look at the other things I currently have, I was recently in Disney, and uh, I vlogged about it, and I shared it with my stream and everything. Thing. And so since that is a topic of discussion for my content, I put up some of the things I got there to kind of give a little bit of thematic element to the stream. And if you otherwise look at my background, I have a very, very basic couch just sitting back there and I don't pile anything on it and I leave it very clean and clear um, so that there's the least distractions for people and they can focus on the gameplay and they can focus on the stream aesthetic and, and not be distracted by, again, dirty laundry or random toys sitting around or, or something like that. So once you have your camera and you have your lighting and you have everything else set up, just take a moment to make sure your stream background reflects the kind of stream that you want to have and give you the best chance for success. And that is pretty much it. Setting up those webcams are pretty simple. And uh, next, we'll be talking about microphones. Welcome to lecture seven, microphones that are best for setting up your stream. Now, before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of which microphones and why, just take a moment to kind of emphasize why a good microphone is so important. More important than a good camera or good lighting or fancy overlays or anything, your microphone is going to be huge. If people hear this horrible static background hiss, if they can't hear you at all, if there's awful background noise, if there's a lot of thumping or when you type, it's physically painful for them to hear, all of these things um, will turn viewers away from your stream and will really just detract from the viewing experience. So it's very, very important to take the time to set up your audio settings and your microphone appropriately. Now, if we're talking about kind of investing in a new microphone and how you're setting up your stream, there's two main microphones that you're going to find while you're browsing Amazon or, you know, another site to kind of see what you want to buy. This is going to be USB and XLR. Now, USBs obviously can be plugged directly into your computer, and they often are just plug and play with little software or setup and very, very easy to use. XLR microphones will require some kind of uh, conversion, whether you're plugging it into a USB converter box that sometimes requires its own power, or uh, a separate setup mixer, and then you are mixing XLR signals together and then outputting it to your computer. XLR mics will pretty much always take an extra step before you're able to use them. Because of this, I kind of don't really advise getting an XLR microphone just because of the hassle. If you are a little more of an audiophile or you have experience with setting up audio, XLR microphones can be a lot higher quality than USB ones because they are designed to be used in studios and for higher quality audio recordings. So that's up to you personally. Um, but if you are just looking for something simple, there are a lot of really great USB microphones out there um, that will not break the bank, that will have great sound quality to them, and you'll just be able to plug them in, which personally I think is very preferable. But I am not an audiophile, uh, but I, I do, I have spent some time making sure that I have great sound quality for my stream. And so the first microphone that a lot of streamers start with is something called the Snowball. And it's literally a, a globe, looks like a you know, snowball, depending on what color you get. It has a little tripod. 
and uh, it's I believe they're going to be around $50 or $60. They go on sale a lot. You can find a great deal. And that's probably the lowest you're going to want to spend on a microphone. Anything beneath that, it won't have durability. It won't have good options. Your sound quality might not be great. Uh, so Snowball is kind of the introductory level microphone that I would be recommending. And the next microphone is the Blue Yeti. Um, the Blue Yeti is what a ton of streamers use. You're going to see it in a lot of different streams. It's a very versatile microphone. It's very, very easy and simple to use. It's what I'm currently using. So if we pull it into view, um, this is what it looks like. I have mine mounted on a mic stand. Uh, this reduces some of the kind of typing sounds by not having it directly sitting on my desk, which can be very nice for my viewers if I go on some angry rant against someone in a video game. And on the back of the microphone, there are a few different recording patterns. So whatever microphone you end up getting, it's important to learn what these recording patterns are. Now there's two main ones, there's cardioid and there's omnidirectional. And so cardioid is a directional recording setting. And so I have that set to on my microphone right now. And so it is recording with this front section of the microphone right here. And then the back is not picking up any noise. This great reduces background noise um, and makes it so that stream can focus on me and not random noises from people outside my apartment or my air conditioning turning on or anything like that. Onidirectional records in every direction. So you get a lot more background noise, but depending on what you're doing, you might want omnidirectional. So say you are a creative streamer um, and you move around your room a lot and you just kind of have one camera that absorbs all that and your microphone's sitting in the center. In that case, you want omnidirectional recording because you want people to be able to hear you no matter where you are. Currently for me, if I get up and walk away from my stream, it's very hard for people to hear me because now I'm on the other side of the microphone, which isn't recording. And the next microphone that you can consider uh, is looking at Audio-Technica microphones. So the AT2020 will actually come both USB and XLR, depending on what setup you want to use. And this is another really, really great microphone. Audio-Technica in general is one of those really well-trusted brands. And then your next step up is to probably look at Rode microphones, uh, which those are probably going to be more heavily on the XLR side, but definitely higher on quality. And so think about your surroundings, how loud your environment is, how close you want the microphone to your mouth, what recording patterns that you want, and kind of take a look through some of these common microphones and choose one that looks best for you. And like I said, I strongly recommend the Yeti. I think it is the most versatile. I think it has great sound quality and you have to do very little tweaking to it to make yourself sound good and have a high quality stream. And so now that you know all these things, you can go and you can look for your own microphone and start adding that, and you're almost done setting up your stream. When you're looking to stream and create content, it's really, really important to have a good rig backing you up. There are a lot of factors that come down to your PC that are going to determine whether or not streaming can really be successful for you. Uh, so really the first thing to think about is the stream quality that you're capable of delivering. If you're looking to play AAA games um, and, and all the newest and greatest things, you really have to make sure that you have the graphics capability to not only play the game yourself at decent graphics settings, but also be able to have the broadcasting ability to share that with your fans. No matter how great the game looks for you, if you're unable to stream it in a similar quality, it can be very hard for people to watch and they're missing out on this really nice experience, which kind of lowers the quality of your stream quite a bit. 
The other thing that a nice rig gives you is flexibility. So if you have a PC that is, you know, just kind of a powerhouse beast that can run anything, that means that when you're looking to stream, you really don't have any limitations. Now this isn't to say that you need to build a, a high-end, super expensive PC. There are a lot of options where you can choose more you know, budget choices and still be able to stream um, some of the better games. Or if you're just looking to be kind of a, a um, IRL variety, you know, more relaxing indie game type thing, you may not need as, as high end of a rig, or if you're looking to be kind of a Hearthstone streamer or even um, Dota 2, these games have a little less system requirements, a little less graphical requirements, so you don't need as high end of a PC. And so that is something we will talk about in later lessons about how to determine what kind of PC you really need to fit your streaming style and your budget. But it's very important to make sure that you have the hardware in place to deliver a good quality stream for the things that you want to share with people. In this lesson, we're going to just briefly run over the decision between buying a rig that's already been built or building one yourself. Now, the very first kind of pro of building a rig yourself is cost. So oftentimes it's a lot cheaper to buy components yourself from different retailers, getting what's on sale, um, and then actually building the PC yourself. So you'll usually save at least a few hundred dollars if you're looking to build your own PC. Now, unfortunately, with this comes a decent level of expertise. It's, uh, it's kind of like advanced Legos. Everything has a place that you slot it into, but if you don't have someone to give you advice and help you and you've never built a PC before, it might be worth spending a little bit of extra money to make sure that you don't ruin any of your components, that the PC will function, and that you just have some lower stress. And so there is a trade-off between kind of cost and expertise and work that you have to put in for pre-built versus, um, you know, making your own custom PC. There's also the, uh, the aspect of warranties and uh, guaranteeing that a PC functions. So if you buy a pre-built PC, that company is going to have, you know, some kind of guarantee that not only will the PC function, it will function for a extended amount of time. When you are doing a pre-built, I would recommend getting the warranty options on some of your more expensive components, but because you're doing the building yourself, you can void those warranties. It can be a little harder to kind of get your PC fixed and troubleshooting. Um, so it, it still comes down to kind of an expertise versus cost thing with warranties. Something that is a great benefit of uh, building your own PC is the extreme level of customization that is available to you. If you're looking for a pre-built and you just head over to Alienware's website, um, they have systems where you have some customization options available, but you won't necessarily be able to pick exactly which retailer is making your graphics card and um, you know exactly what kind of RAM that you have, or you won't necessarily be able to get exactly the graphics card that you want. And then on top of that, if you are someone who loves LEDs and cool fans and different kinds of cooling and, and all those things, and you really, really get into case modding and, and all those neat things, um, building it yourself means that you can kind of create a work of art that represents your personality and will fit in with the stream even better. Uh, so the big thing that it's going to come down to is you're going to want to choose, do you want to build your own PC and kind of take some of the risks that go with that, but also you kind of get a lot more 
potential benefits? Or do you want to just buy a PC, have it already all come put together, everything works, software is all set and ready to go? And that's just a decision that you will have to make in our next lesson, our activity. So for our third lecture, we have an activity for you guys, which is going to be figuring out the budget level that you want for the rig that you're going to build before we go into talking about all the different components. So the first thing to do is to decide whether you want pre-built or if you want to build it yourself. After that, make a list of three games that you want to stream. Now, you'll need to see if your current PC can handle these games or take a look and see what kind of PC is going to be able to handle these. So there's a link systemrequirementslab.com slash C-Y-R-I that will tell you the requirements to stream a whole variety of different games. Now, to just give you a general idea, games like Hearthstone are much lower on streaming, um, whereas something like Dota or League of Legends is kind of a medium requirement. And then the high-end things that take a really powerful PC to stream are something um, like all the AAA games, so new Assassin's Creed or um, you know potentially something like Destiny or you know maybe even the Dark Souls games if you want to stream at 60 FPS. Uh, so AAA titles, high-end PC, a lot of esports are in the mid-range, and then lower range are slower moving games, strategy games, lower graphic demand games. So once you have those games figured out for what you want to stream, take a look at your current rig, decide can it handle the games you want to stream, do you need to build a new one, and once you've made that decision, you can figure out what budget you need for upgrades. So do you have a large budget at your disposal and you really want to hit those AAA games, or do you only need a few upgrades, maybe even to your existing PC, and you don't even need to build an entirely new one? And so go through this activity, figure out what you need, and then continue with the lectures as I'm going to take you through all the different components and what you need to build a you know, moderate level streaming rig all the way up to a high level luxury one. Welcome to the second half of uh, this section about building a PC. Uh, so this will be taking you through all the different PC parts and where you can buy them, as well as where to find pre-built PCs and what best way to customize them for your streaming platform. And then we'll have an activity where you research building your rig and put together one with a whole budget spreadsheet and everything so that you are set and ready to build. To see the linked website for links and more information about all the different parts that I mentioned. I will be going through a lot of them and we do have resources attached to this course um, to list out the specific different PC components and where you can find them.
Welcome to lecture five. The first lecture, we're going to discuss some of the different computer components. And so in this lecture, I'm going to tell you about some of the different current CPUs that are on the market and then talk about why we are starting with your processor CPU and why that's kind of your most important factor for determining a gaming and streaming PC. And so streaming, first of all, is a very, very CPU intensive process. It doesn't rely nearly as heavily on your graphics card as it does on the CPU. So investing the majority of your budget into a processor is going to give you the best longevity with your build and kind of the best value for streaming. And so there's a lot of different processor options out there. Most people tend to use Intel. So there are ways in which the Intel um, systems are built that are actually slightly better uh, for gaming with the way that they use cores. Um, so if you kind of break it down in the nitty gritty, uh, which I won't go too much into, but essentially most, you have two options. You have Intel and you have AMD. Now most AMD processors actually have a lot more cores. So it seems like they'd be a lot more powerful. But the way that most modern games are currently coded actually takes advantage of Intel's architecture much better than AMD's. And so a lot of people are going to recommend that you use Intel. And I personally have been using Intel for the past few years and I used to have an AMD build. Honestly, they both work great, so that's really up to you. One of the benefits of AMD is they're oftentimes a little bit cheaper, and like I said, you are getting a lot more cores, so you're theoretically getting a lot more processing power out of it. And the way that games use cores and processing power could very well change in the upcoming years now that these higher-end machines are so much more accessible and so many more people have them. And so if we talk about Intel first, you're probably gonna wanna invest into an i7. Uh, and these are these are really just top of the line what's going to be best for streaming i5s can stream but that's definitely on the more moderate you know you like, I'm going to use Hearthstone a lot as an example that's more on like the Hearthstone streaming level um, and if you want to play any kind of faster paced game you really should invest in an i7 and it really is an investment because it should last you quite a while for stream quality and so i7s, what you're going to be looking for is a 6700, 7700, 8700 are the current model numbers. Um, and if it has a little K after it, that means that you can manually overclock them yourself in the BIOS setting. So you get a little more processor speed out of those builds and they do cost uh, just a little bit more. Uh, but if you are tech savvy, then it can be worth it to get the K version uh, for the little bit of extra money. Now for AMDs, the equivalent to these i7s would be something like the Ryzen 7 1800X. And then if you want a really, really time-proof investment, luxury, high-end build, you're going to be looking at either i9s from Intel's or Threadrippers from AMD. And I give you a price idea, i7s should be somewhere in the $300 to $500 range, and then the i9s and the Threadrippers from AMD are looking more like the $800 to 1000 So it is a significant price increase, and you really don't need those processors to stream, but because they are so powerful, if you build a PC with an i9 or a Threadripper in it, you're probably going to be able to use that PC for a very long time. And so you have to take a look at your budget and think about um, the games that you're going to be playing based on that activity that you've already done and figure out uh, how much you want to devote to your CPU. Now, like I said, CPU really is pretty much the most important factor for streaming. So you want to invest the majority of your budget into this uh, and then you can upgrade later components as you go as long as you have a strong CPU to start with. Welcome to lecture six, the GPU. So we've already discussed CPUs. The next thing to talk about is your graphics card. 
Now, again, this is going to be the same thing as kind of the CPUs. Lower end games require less graphics, which means you need a lower end graphics card if you want to stream them. And then the better your game is, or you know that the newer your game is oftentimes with these AAA games, you will need a pretty high end graphics card to be able to play it. So here there is an AMD versus Nvidia discussion. Um, and the AMD cards used to not be as good, but recently they have really stepped up their game and are pretty on par with the Nvidia cards. Uh, so you can do pretty well with both of them. I am just, you know, Nvidia person as well. So I tend to stick with those, uh, but graphics cards, there are constantly new ones coming out. So there are a few resources you should use to evaluate really which graphics cards actually have the best performance. Just because a company releases one with a higher number on it doesn't necessarily mean it'll be better for gaming or streaming. So there are two places that are really great to go. Tom's Hardware and PC Magazine very often put out uh, GPU performance articles and talk about the best graphics cards of the year, the best value cards, the best luxury cards, and, and what they work really well for, and they benchmark them and do performances. And so that's really the first place you wanna look and see what are the really good cards right now, how much am I planning on spending, um, and, and what kind of value can I get from these? So once you go through and look at that, um, I have just a few cards I'm gonna mention that you can take a look at, and you can use these as kind of baselines to determine um, if the newer cards that have come out are better than these, worse than these, where you wanna spend your money, what kind of cards you wanna get. So if we're looking at AMD, kind of a mid-range card is the, four, or the RX 480, eight gigabyte, um, and that's a pretty good mid-range card with the MSRP being around 240 USD. And then a higher end card that is going to be three to four times as expensive is the Radeon RX Vega. So if you are looking at that budget build, uh, you're streaming 30 or 60 FPS, you don't need your in-game to be beautiful, you don't need everything on ultra graphics, you wanna think about these mid-range cards. And if you're looking at higher end, then that's where the Radeon RX Vega might come in. And then as far as the Nvidia ones, what I would say is the budget option would be looking at something like the 960 or the 1050 Ti, which are gonna be 100 to 200 in that middle range there, uh, which is definitely budget for graphics cards. The next step up from that would be a 970 or a 1060. And this is gonna about double in cost. We're looking around 300 uh, US dollars here. And then your luxury option that you probably do need to be a AAA game streamer um, are 980, 1080, 1080 Ti's. And these have MSRPs of 600 to $1,000. Um, so they are quite a bit more. They're kind of on par with those high-end processors we were talking about in the previous lecture. They will ensure that you have a very smooth stream with high FPS and a great viewing experience for people. And although the building a new PC can be very expensive, if you go for a luxury build, you're looking at several thousand dollars. Again, graphics cards can be a very good investment because you will be able to use the same one for years. Um, and you might have to turn down your settings five years from now on a AAA game, but right now you can play it at Ultra and uh, you know eventually invest in upgrading your card. But so those are your options. Um, and again, don't forget, attached to these lectures, we do have uh, you know, resource information sheets with these things listed with the websites that I've mentioned and the different levels of cards. So make sure to check that out and uh, do your research to figure out which card is gonna work best for your build. In lecture seven, we're going to talk about motherboards, RAM, and your hard drive. So the first one, motherboards, 
These really depend on what CPU you choose. So whatever CPU you choose, whether it's AMD or Intel, there will be motherboards with matching sockets that are um, compatible with the CPU that you've chosen. Once you've chosen your CPU, you can look at all the different motherboards that are available and compatible with it. And then you only have really a few more decisions that you have to make. So there is something called SLI for NVIDIA cards and Crossfire for AMD cards. And this basically means you can take two cards um, and have them work together. So instead of just having one card, you can have two of them handling the graphics load, really increasing your graphics power. Uh, so you do need motherboards that are capable and set up to handle either SLR or SLI or Crossfire. Uh, and if it's something that you're not interested in, then you don't necessarily need a motherboard that can do that. Now another uh, consideration is not all motherboards come with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth in them. Some do, not all of them. They should all have Ethernet connect connectivity available. Uh, but if you want Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, which is a great idea, say if you want to use a controller and connect by Bluetooth for gaming, that's generally good. Um, and, your, and the motherboard you want doesn't come with it. You can actually purchase this as a separate installment and actually install it into the PC so that you have uh, wireless and Bluetooth capabilities with your PC. Now for the next component you need to think about is your RAM. So this is your memory. This is kind of um, all of the tasks that your computer is actively doing takes up memory. So streaming uses a decent amount and then different games also use different amounts of memory. So I would recommend having at least 16 gigabytes of RAM. You can either do that with four, four gigabyte sticks, two eights or one sixteen. Uh, are the ways that those come. You can expand up quite a bit. I know people with 128 gigabyte builds. I will say that it's completely unnecessary for streaming anything right now. 16 is more than sufficient. When you go and start looking up RAM, you'll see that there's something called DDR3 and DDR4. Based on everything that I've read, there's not a huge performance difference between the two. DDR4 is just newer. And uh, again, this also depends on your motherboard. So motherboard will, won't necessarily be compatible for both. So whichever motherboard you pick, make sure you pick matching compatible memory. And in our activity further on in this section, we will discuss ways to check compatibility and make sure that your build all works together. So don't worry about that right now. And now the last thing is your, your hard drive. So how you're actually storing data. I very strongly recommend getting an SSD these, um, it's called a solid state drive. This should be your boot drive. Your computer will restart very, very quickly. I cannot tell you how many times I have had a stream derailed by a Windows update or something happening. And when my PC reboots very quickly because it's an SSD, I'm very happy because that means my stream has only been down for a short time. And so I would really recommend an SSD for your boot drive. And you want to look at something that's maybe 256 uh, gigabytes. You can use a smaller one, but you do run into some storage issues, especially if you want to store games on your SSD, so those also boot faster. And then you probably want at least a two terabyte, uh, and you can do HDD, so you can do just you know a normal hard drive uh, for your kind of backup hard drives where you store a lot of things. Especially if you're going to do video editing with your stream, you'll need quite a bit of space to store all those files. Just to throw a few brand names out there so you kind of know what you're looking for, uh, some good options for RAM are Kingston or Corsair, and then uh, some of your SSD HDD needs uh, Western Digital and Seagate are both really great and very affordable for those. And so that covers your motherboard, your RAM, and your storage on your PC. And again, like I said, later we'll talk about ways to make sure all of your parts are compatible to help you put together your build.
Welcome to lecture eight, the peripherals. So there's a lot of different things that people mean by peripherals. Uh, so, you know, might be talking about mouse and keyboard or monitors or anything like that. Mouse and keyboard is everybody's own personal preference. We're not really gonna talk about that. You know what you like to game on, but there is a little discussion to be made about kind of monitors and then other little accessories you can kind of purchase for your streaming setup. So for monitors, I would recommend you have at least two. Uh, you definitely want something in addition to what you're gaming on because you want to be able to interact with your chat. Streams without any interaction do exist, but generally those streams are huge and are already established. When you're starting out with a stream, you're going to want to interact with your chat. You want to be able to see it. And so what you should have is your main gaming monitor and then somewhere that's easy to look at, you should have a second monitor um, with your chat up on it, maybe with music or different controls or soundboard or anything like that. Well, keep in mind that right now you can only stream at 60 FPS. So you don't need your monitors to be super high FPS um, for the sake of streaming or anything like that. Like if you're running your game at 120 FPS because you want to be able to stream at 120 FPS and then you want 120 FPS monitors so that you can see it at that, that's completely unnecessary. If you are happy playing at 60 and you already have monitors that do 60, that's fine. Now, if you want that 144 hertz monitor to be the amazing Counter-Strike or Dota player and have the really, really fast refresh times, that's perfectly fine. Your stream will not get the same benefit, so definitely do not need to invest in that for your secondary monitor. But that's just the basic of monitors. Really, you want at least two, and you can add more depending on what you like to have on your desk, although I would recommend against having too much to look at, um, because then you might get confused and derailed a little bit. So think about how you like to game and how you like to interact, and just make sure you have at least, at least a way to read chat. That's very important. Now, the next kind of peripheral to talk about is something that's um, not everybody has them, but they are rather fancy and shiny. So there's something called a Stream Deck by Elgato, and uh, these are very, very cool, and we'll just show you the picture on the box. But essentially, it is a bunch of um, panels, like little buttons, that you can program what they look like so the buttons are not set. You can put whatever image you want on them, and they will control different elements of your stream. You can switch scenes on your OBS or XSplit between, um, you know, if you get up to get a drink, you can click the BRB screen. Uh, if you want to mute your microphone, you can just hit a button on here. If you want to pause or play your music or skip a song, if you want to play a certain sound, if you want to enter a command in chat, um, this is all programmed by you. You set up the buttons, you control what it does, and it is a very, very nice tool to kind of add production level to your stream. Um, definitely not necessary. This is just kind of gravy or extra. You know, if you have a really high budget, you want to set up your stream to be a really high production quality, this is definitely something that's worth investing in. And then also by Elgato, um, our kind of the next peripheral that I'll just briefly mention, if you want to stream from a console um, and, and, and capture something that's not running through your PC, or you want to do what's called a two PC setup, where you game on one PC and stream from another one, that some people do, you'll need something called a capture card. Now, pretty much you're just going to look up Elgato capture cards and find the one that works best for you, but this enables you to stream content from something that is not on your PC. So if that's something that interests you, looking into a capture card does expand your options of what you want to stream if you don't want to just stream off your existing PC or just stream PC games. And so that's it for our peripheral discussion. Like I said, mice and keyboard, that's all on you, um, but definitely recommend two monitors. And if you're really feeling the extras, check out Elgato for their stream deck and their capture cards.
Welcome to lecture nine. Now that we've gone through all of the different PC parts, kind of giving you an overview of what to look for for your different build levels, we should probably talk about where you can buy these PC parts or to those of you who decided to do pre-build, uh, some of your options for customization. So if you've decided to build yourself, um, one of the key websites that you absolutely must go to is called PC Part Picker. Now on PC Part Picker, you, as it sounds, create your own custom builds. And so you will pick a PC part. And once you have picked one part, when you search for the next one, so say you pick your CPU first and you pick an i7-6700. When you search for a motherboard, it will only show you motherboards that are compatible with the current CPU that you have picked. And so you can go through and you can pick your CPU, GPU, motherboard, RAM, hard drive, everything, and the website will evaluate the components and it will tell you whether or not they're compatible with each other and make sure that every piece you buy will actually fit together when you're building your own PC. The other cool thing that this website does is it shows you prices for the different PC parts across several popular websites. Uh, so it'll be like Amazon, Newegg, and then I believe it shows you Micro Center, which is a United States-based store. Um, you can physically go and buy things instead of ordering online, which I know is a crazy concept. Um, but so PC Part Picker is really one you, where you want to start if you're doing a, a uh, build your own system. And, and even if you're not in the United States, or you don't have access to the same retailers, this site will still be really good to make sure that all of your parts are compatible. And then once you have that build, you're going to want to shop around. So you're going to want to look at sites like Amazon or Newegg, or you're going to want to figure out what computer stores are local around you and, and check if they have a, I'm sure they have a website, check if they have any deals, what their current prices are. You don't have to buy every part from the same place. That's one of the beautiful things about pre-built and why it's often cheaper than, um, or sorry, that's one of the things that's beautiful about building it yourself and why it's often cheaper is because you can shop around for parts and get good deals. And then of course, you're also saving on labor. Uh, so you wanna check, like I said, local stores and then different online retailers that are local to your country and um, just Amazon and Newegg are, are great places to start. Now, if you don't wanna build your PC and you just wanna buy a pre-built and you're listening to me list off all of these components and all of these different places, I do want to assure you that even with pre-built PCs, there's still a lot of customization options. And so usually you'll be able to pick different CPU levels, different GPUs, you'll be able to add or take away more RAM, change your hard drive sizes. So you have a lot of customization options. And so some of the sites that you can do this on are Dell and then their Alienware PCs are very, very good for gaming if a little bit pricey. And then there's also places like iBuyPower um, that have really great PCs at a slightly better discount. I will say with those based on reviews I've seen online, a lot of times the components aren't as well put together. So sometimes you might need to open up the PC and just re-socket things and just tighten them up a little bit. So some of the cheaper options might be good for someone who's somewhat comfortable with PC components, but not enough to build their own entire build. And if you kind of want the no worry approach, then going somewhere like Alienware from Dell or the high end um, Asus gaming rigs might be your best option. And again, take a look at what is uh, best available in your country. Um, and, you know, sometimes international shipping might work big worth it depends on what the import fees are uh, and just and figure out and again local stores a lot of times have great deals look up and see um, are you a student most of these places do have great student discounts I know that HP um, at the time when I ordered a PC from them had a 10% student discount and um, you can also look at sites like eBay or Groupon and try and find deals on pre-built PCs the caveat with these is that they will not be customizable. Generally, you'll kind of just have to go with the build that's available, but sometimes they'll have a build that works for you available and you'll be able to get a PC at a really great discount without having to build it yourself. And some of the benefits of the pre-build are definitely if something goes wrong, you have kind of a more comprehensive warranty. For those of you who are building the PC yourself, I would recommend buying the warranties on your more expensive parts, especially the CPU, and you don't necessarily need it on the RAM, um, and some of them come with warranties anyways without you buying them. But because you built it yourself, if something goes wrong on the machine, it is your job to figure out. So that's another risk with pre-built that is the trade-off for it being cheaper. 
And again, like I said, please see the attached resources to this course. They will list out all of these websites and resources for you um, and to help you with building your PC or customizing a pre-built one. Welcome to lecture 10, what you've probably all been waiting for, or might have already started with, our activity where you get to start designing and building your gaming rig. So you're going to play around between your budget and the performance that you're looking for and try and figure out which components are best for you. And so your first step is to pick your processor and then your GPU. Then you're going to go head over to PCPartPicker.com or for you guys doing pre-builds, you're gonna to head to your pre-built site and start customizing. And you're gonna figure out what parts you want, your list of components, everything that's compatible. And as you do this, you're gonna think about your budget and the performance that you want and balance between them. And you're gonna put this all into a spreadsheet that we have attached to this activity so that you can keep track of which parts you want, the best place to buy them, and what your final build and budget are. Good luck, have fun.